All right, here we are. The dull bottle class for Soli Deo Gloria, the final of our five solas. Does anyone know what Soli Deo Gloria means? Glory to God alone. Glory to God alone. That's right. That's it right here on my bookmark. Oh. Sharon got a bookmark that says Soli Deo Gloria, the glory of God alone. So we have this it, as the final of our, our solas, like I said. Um, we might even call it the sum of the solas. Does anyone know? We're going to do some more math here. Does anyone know why Soli Deo Gloria can be called the sum of, of the other four? Let's, let's add them up. Sola Scriptura. What do you remember about Sola Scriptura? Sola Scriptura. Sola Scriptura. Uh, scripture alone. Scripture alone. Where do we get Scripture from? God. We got Scripture from God. Right now we have sola, sola fide. What do you remember from sola fide class? Nothing. <laughs> yeah. Sola fide. What do who who? Sola fide is the doctrine of faith. It's justification of faith alone, right? Who justifies? God. God justifies. Sola gratia. Sola gratia. Grace. Who has grace? God. God does. G-O-D. I can spell that one. Solus Christus. Solus Christus. In Christ alone. Who is Christ? God. Christ is God. Um... Solus Christus, we rest on the finished work of Christ, the blood of Christ, whose plan was it for Christ to die for your sins? You see a pattern here? God. So if we was to do this in a mathematical equation, God plus God plus God plus God equals soli deo gloria. What can we say to these? Scripture alone from God. Faith alone. God is the one who justifies by faith alone. Through no action of our own, we receive it passively. By the grace of God alone, we rest in the finished work and blood of Christ alone. What can we say other than... <laughs> to praise God. Yeah. Praise God. That's why Soli Deo Gloria can be called the sum of all of the other four. I just want to go on record as saying Mark may have done algebra last week, but you are doing calculus this week. Yeah, yeah, I am. It's good stuff. We have a great quote on the handout by John Piper where he kind of um, ties them all together. You can fill in the blanks as I go. We are justified before God by grace alone on the basis of Christ's blood and righteousness alone. Through the means or instrument of faith alone for the ultimate glory of God alone as taught with final and decisive authority in Scripture alone. John Piper. So what is the glory of God. What do we mean when we say to God alone be the glory? What is glory? And what is the glory of God? I want it to turn to one of my favorite passages of Scripture to illustrate this. You'd think I'd have it um, memorized by now, but I do not. I'm not very good at Scripture memorization. Turn to Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah chapter 6.
Isaiah chapter 6, beginning at verse 1. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim. Each had six wings, and with two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called. And the house was filled with smoke. And I would love to go on. I would love to talk about King and Zion. And I would love to talk about high and lift it up. And I would love to talk about all of those other things. But we don't have time. And what we really want to focus on is the call of the seraphim here. So the first, what's the first thing that jumps out to us when we look at the call of the seraphim? That, that word holy, is, it's, it's there three times. God isn't holy. God isn't holy, holy. God is holy, holy, holy. Does anyone know why that word is used three times? Oh, that's a great connection. Yeah. Not what I'm going for, but that's a great connection. I was just going to say, no end to his holiness. Amen to that. That's not what I was looking for either, but you're going to get one because there is no end to his holiness. There is no end to his holiness. And you're right, in a sense, I think you are right in that. The Hebrew way of emphasis, does anybody remember what the Hebrew way of emphasis is? Repetition, Repetition, that's right. Jesus says, truly, truly, I say to you. This is like, hey, hold up and listen. This is for real. Truly, truly. But God isn't holy, holy. God is holy, holy, holy. This This is extra important. Extra. God is extra. (laughs) And the word holy is used, and the word holy is a little bit tough to define because it's used in scriptures in so many different ways. But the basic meaning of the word holy is separate. It means separate. The word, the, the root word, um, means to cut. So we have, it means separate. It also means to cut. In a sense, we could say that holy means a cut above. A cut above. It also means sacred. So you have, it means separate, a cut above, sacred. Now notice how the seraphim moves from God's holiness to glory. So he starts in holy, 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 and he ends with the glory is the whole earth is full of his glory. Holy, holy, holy is the Yahweh, the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the Hebrew word that's translated as glory, uh, it means weight. But it's not the, the literal sense of, of weight. Like, you know, the whole earth is full of his 183 pounds. It, it's a figurative sense of, of weight. It means weightiness. Uh, splendor, uh, uh, an abundance of riches. Uh, it means honor and, and dignity. So it means it's, it's weightiness in the sense of honor and dignity and splendor and, and abundant, uh, abundance and riches. So the holiness of God, the infinite cut above-ness, the separateness the sacredness of God radiates out and it fills the whole earth for all to see with his weightiness, his 
abundance of riches, his honorableness, his dignified splendor. And that is what we call his glory. It's not something that God has in the sense that he possesses it. It radiates out of him. It radiates out of his worth and his beauty and his greatness. It radiates out of him himself. He himself is a cut above, sacred, separate, weighty, honorable, and dignified. It radiates out of him. And the weightiness and the honorableness and the greatness is to be seen and basked in and then reflected back to him by his people. I was sitting at my desk preparing for this and I had one of those moments where I kind of had to put everything down and just kind of like collect my thoughts and I reached for a book called The Valley of Vision, a collection of Puritan prayers. And I have a copy that I had signed by a pastor, a theologian who I greatly appreciate. And he put, he signed his name, then he put a, a scripture reference. And, and I didn't, I just, I was reaching for it and I looked it up and the scripture reference was Romans 11.36. And I went, what? Romans 11.36? What? So I, and I opened it. Mind you, I was trying to take a break at the, at the time. But. <laughs> Romans 11.36 says, From him, and through him, and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. So everything is from God. Everything is through God. Everything is given back to God for his glory. He is the beginning. He is the middle. And he is the end. If he's the end, why is his glory the end? Why is his glory the end of everything? The, not the end, but maybe the goal of everything. As it's all throughout Scripture, we can see that the end goal is for the glory of God. It was his plan to reveal his glory from before there was even a beginning to anything. Psalm 19. The heavens declare the glory of God. They're there to declare God's glory. That's what they're there for. He made them to declare his glory. Isaiah 43, 6 says, Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the end of the earth, everyone who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory, whom I formed and made. We, his creation, were created for his glory. That was our, that's our purpose. That's why he did it. It's his purpose in everything. God, Ephesians 1, 11 and 12. God works all things according to the counsel of his will. Pause. Back up. What? God works what things? All things. According to the counsel of his will. God is meticulously sovereign. God works all things according to the counsel of his will. Why? So that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. glory. He works all things. This church is here. God put it here. Men built the church, but God built the church. It's here for his glory. That rhododendron bush out there, you might like him, you might hate him, it doesn't matter. Because it's there for God's glory. You... Give God the glory and the honor that he's due for creating that, whether you like it or not. That's what it's there for. I would add just to what you're saying, Luke, that I think it is all these things you mentioned. They're there for his glory. They're there to, I'd add the word display. Yeah. They're there to display. Absolutely. Because that's the goal. God's goal from the beginning, from before the foundation of the earth until we sit at a great wedding feast for eternity is to display his glory. Yeah. That's right. So if it's there to display his glory, and we are there to recognize that glory, and we are there to reflect that glory back to him, how is God glorified most fully? If everything is for the glory of God, we as his redeemed people glorify him most fully when? Do you, does anyone know the, the answer to the first question of the Westminster Catechism. Some people just call it the Catechism, but we'll call it the Westminster Catechism. 
The question, the first question, is what is the chief end of man? To glorify God. You're, you're half right. You're, you're, you're halfway there. There's an end. To glorify God and enjoy, enjoy Him forever. To glorify God and enjoy Him forever. Forever. The Westminster Divines understood that God's glory and our joy go hand in hand. They go hand in glove. They understood that Jesus, who became a servant in order that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy, and that Jesus, who has welcomed us for the glory of God, also said concerning his sheep in John 10, they know his name. But he said that he came, Jesus said, I came that they may have life. And what? And and they might have it to the fullest. They might have it abundant. Jesus welcomed us for the glory of God. That is, uh, I have some scripture verses for that, but I'm running out of time, so I'm trying to to go through. That's uh, Romans 15. Jesus says, or Paul says, Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. Jesus, who did that, also said that he came that we might have life abundantly. So glory and life abundant. Those are the things that Jesus came for. Glorifying God, life abundant. Psalm uh, 23 paints the picture of a sheep who's basking in the superabundance of the pasture, or of the pastor, the shepherd. So there, we're talking about Soli Deo Gloria, glory of God alone, glory of God alone, to the glory of God alone. That's why we were made to the glory of God alone. But there are scripture verses that talk about our glorification, right? I knew Kevin was going to ask, so I'm saying it before. <laughs> Romans 8.30, best chapter in the whole Bible, Romans chapter 8, Romans 8.30. Is it? It is. Do you want me to, re- on your deck, we are, we're, we're first cousins. And we're like brothers. And I'm going to out, we are brothers in Christ, and I'm going to outlive him. Justin, on, on your deathbed, would you like me to read you uh, the 11th chapter of Leviticus? Or would you like me to read you Romans chapter 8? It's the best chapter in the whole Bible, brother. Romans chapter 8, verse 30 says. Those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. So, And those whom he justified, he also glorified. Right? So Paul's using a future tense there to kind of indicate the surety of it all. We will be glorified. Well... Why is God intent to glorify us? If we are to glorify Him, and the way that we can most fully glorify Him is by enjoying Him, how can we, as creatures of flesh and sin, how can we really grasp the glory of God? I mean, we can't even look on the glory of God or we'll die. Moses got kind of a sideways, backwards glance at God around a rock, and, and they couldn't even look at his face as he, as he reflected that. That, that glory was a, a glancing <coughs> sight of the back of God, and it radiated off into that, a veil his face to, to cover it. So we can't handle it yet. That's, that's why we will be glorified, because we can't handle the full radiance and glory of God right now. Uh, we've been talking uh, in Latin. We've been speaking Latin. Solas here, solas there. I got another one for you. I can write it down for you later. Simul justus et peccator. Yeah, yeah. I almost got it tattooed on my arm. Simul justus et peccator. It means simultaneously justified and peccator means sin. Piccadillo means sin. Peccator means sinner. Simultaneously just and sinner. That's why we will be glorified in the future. Because right now we're still sinners. Even though we're justified. Even though we rest in Christ alone. We've read about him in scripture alone. 
time to go. No, I'm going to leave us. I'm going to leave us with uh, some homework. I want you to think about some practical. I know. I want you to think about some practical ways to display God's glory on a daily basis. And then I want you to put those things that you think about into action. Because what good is it to just learn these things and not have it change you? If you don't go out of here changed, then what good is it? So homework, think about some ways to display God's glory on a daily basis, and then put it into action. I'm going to check in with you, Chris. I'm going to leave us with one thing here. I got the final word. I just want to say that we hope that these solas have been helpful for you. Uh, as we kind of look at some of these essential truths of the Christian faith, we hope it's been clear that they point to the heart of the gospel. That's what these souls do, is they point us to the heart of the gospel, which is the power of God into salvation to everyone who believes. We hope it's given you a deeper understanding of your own faith, of your own salvation, and how incredibly gracious God has been towards you. And I heard this one time, and I'm going to use it again. We hope that it has kind of given you that gospel ballast that you need to weather the storms of life. And uh, I'm going to close this with a, with a quote from one of my mentors, R.C. Sproul. We do not segment our lives uh, giving some time to God and some time to our business or our schooling while keeping parts to ourselves. The idea is to live all our lives in the presence of God under the authority of God and for the honor and glory of God. That is what the Christian life is about. We live coram deo before the face of God. Go in grace. Okay.